Suicide Zen Forgiveness, the pod that shares the stories of those affected by suicide. Lost a loved one? Attempted it yourself? Did you know that when you share a burden, the load is lightened? Come listen in with your host, Elaine Lindsay. Suicide Zen Forgiveness, the podcast, is for education only. Some of the subject matter could be triggering for those that are newly grieving or in a poor state of mental health. Please call your local suicide hotline or mental health office if you need immediate help. My guest today is Carling Middlestead. She's an event planner by trade, a stepmom to two kids, a fur mom to five dogs, and an anti extraordinaire. For most of her young life, Carling followed the straight agenda, if you will, until she accidentally married a man. Uh, He was possibly the worst man, and she left him. She's now living life as her truly, authentically gay self, and I'm very happy to welcome her today. And so without further ado, I present Carling. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi. Oh, my gosh. Thank you so much. It's it's really wonderful to have you here. And I want to thank you again for having me last year on yeah. your podcast. We have expanded things here at Suicide Zen to include mental health and trauma and emotions and feelings and all the the messy bits of life because I think it's important for us to talk about those things in light of some of the heavy topics that we cover. Uh, not that mental health is is a lighter topic, but it's a let's say more present topic at the moment. And because we've all gone through these past few years uh, with this pandemic and uh, the rest of the insanity that's happening in the world, I honestly don't believe there's anybody that is not struggling in some way that's not had to deal with, with trauma, mental health, or what have you. So I invited Carling here today to talk with us and we are just going to let Carling jump in and we'll go where spirit takes us. <laughs> oh, that could be dangerous. <laughs> All right. Dangerous is good. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for, for having me. I know you interviewed my co-host, Michelle, and she's got, you know, a very um, suicide adjacent story. And, you know, that was one of the reasons we started our podcast was just to tell people's stories. And, you know, through that and through listening to your show, even though, you know, I don't maybe have as close of a connection to suicide, I've certainly lost people I love to suicide. And um, my, you know, in reflecting, you know, on what I could share, you know, it really came evident that the one of the things that I went through in leaving an abusive marriage was how hard I had to fight for my life, both you know, it would have been it would have been really easy for me to just give it up and, yeah. um, you know, have instant relief from everything I was going through. And, um, you know, the person I left really made it their mission to end my life either by my own hands or their hands. And yeah, so I think, you know, I think we don't talk enough about um, the struggles people go through, you know, even if you're not actively suicidal you know you you often find yourself in situations where you're fighting for your life because yes. because it you know it would be really easy and tempting sometimes to go down the other road and you know i i think the more we share these experiences the more people can feel like okay i'm not the only one out here and that you know there's another absolutely. side absolutely and 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 i i knew you would you would take it in the right direction because I think it's important for people to understand that suicide and being suicide adjacent and um, just the whole thing to do with suicide ideation can be a fleeting thing. 
based on circumstance. And I do understand, you know, in, in the case of domestic abuse, uh, just an end to that abuse, uh, uh, being able to sort of remove yourself from that situation at times can be a wish for, for an end. And that definitely makes sense to me. But I know that uh, there's a lot more to you than that. There's a lot more to the traumas and, and the things that you have have gone through in your life. And um, I think that's a good place for us to go on to. Yeah. So I do you want me to just dive in? Absolutely. Absolutely. And we'll we'll just I, I like to just follow follow where this leads because sure. I think our audience needs to hear what you want to share and and that's what's truly important to me. Yeah, sure. So I think my story really starts, I, you know, part of my um, bio and podcast is that we joke that I'm a lesbian that accidentally married a man. Um, mm -hmm. I had come out when I was really young and got put back in the closet. And I really ended up, um, you know, I, I really, I was a people pleaser. I wanted to be accepted. I wanted to be loved. And so it became a lot easier to sort of sign up for this. I call it the straight agenda. You know, I, yeah. you get a checklist and it's okay. After school, you got to, yeah, marry, you find a man, you marry him, you buy a house, you buy an SUV, you get a dog, then you start having kids. Then, you know, and there's, yeah. you just have this checklist and your society really celebrates each one of these Absolutely. accomplishments. And, you know, it's it, for some, you know, I grew up, I was really bullied as a kid and mm -hmm. I was certainly not the most favorite child between me and my sister. And, you know, that really, that really created this sense of wanting to belong, this desperation to belong and be right. celebrated and fit in. And, you know, I discovered really quickly that, you know, when I was with, when I was dating a guy, my family was ecstatic. They included me more you know, I was really celebrated. And so all my friends were getting married, my co host, Michelle included, I was a bridesmaid at her wedding. And I really remember just having this moment of like, okay, well, I guess I better find somebody like marry a man. And so I went on an online dating app. And I had one of my, like a picture and a bio. And pretty soon after I got a message from this guy and it said, Hey, I think we live in the same building. I was in a condo oh. and I was like, Oh, and I was like, no, the picture on my profile, that's my friend's condo. Like I don't live there. And he was like, yeah, you live in this shape building by the Walmart. And I was like, Oh yeah, I do. And I sort of romanticized it and thought to myself, you know, this is so serendipitous. And what are the chances that this, you know, guy lives in my building and then we met online. So to this day, I don't know, you know, if there was anything more to it than that, but I suspect there was. And I was, if I were to describe myself back then, uh, it would have been like early 2000s. I was insecure about my body. You know, all my friends were getting married. I felt left out a lot. Um, I didn't have really high self-esteem and I was just kind of lost in this world of being in my early twenties and not sure where life was going. And, you know, I, you know, they say predators, uh, do a really good job at grooming and, you know, I was ripe for the picking. I was, you know, everybody was like, when are you going to start dating? When are you going to start dating? When are you going to get married? And so I had this pressure on me to meet these expectations. And, you know, this guy, for the sake of anonymity, we call him Chad. He right away was so charming and so friendly and, you know, wanted to take me for dinner. And so very quickly, our relationship, it moved very quickly, uh. you know, and, and he, from our very first date, he had a very tragic story about his childhood and how he grew up. And so I instantly felt like really bad for him. Yeah. And he, you know, what I now know is he love bombed me and he very quickly narrowed the distance between him and I. So 
yeah. you know, we were always at one of each other's apartments. We were always on the phone. We were always texting. We did everything together. And so I never had space to breathe or spray, space to sit back and question if it was something that I wanted and, and liked. And, and no doubt this was helping you be seen mm -hmm. by friends and family as doing what they expected. Absolutely. Yeah. Suddenly I was invited to all the couples game nights and, you know, my family was so excited and my dad was texting me, asking me all the time how it was going. And it was like, I was suddenly getting what I was craving so much from my childhood. And so, you know, who am I to, you know, to question things that were maybe very, very tiny red flags and nobody else questioned it. Everybody was so excited. So, you know, I just, I just embraced it and, it's interesting because I always look back at it with hindsight. So, yeah. you know, I know that he moved the relationship along really quickly so that I was trapped and he was, everybody loved him. He was so charming. And, you know, I, I joke that if he had, you know, punched me in the face on our first date, there probably wouldn't have been a second date. And he knew this, it was very calculated. Oh yeah. yeah. And so, you know, before I knew it, you know, after just a few months, he wanted to move in together you know, to save money. It made sense. We lived in the same building anyway. And it was that sort of once we moved in together that, and I can't remember like every specific, but like he did the first thing. Maybe he, uh, I don't know, talked to another girl online. And I was like, oh, like that's not good. Yeah. But it wasn't really that bad. And we lived together. It was going to be more of a hassle to break up and move out then just work through this one tiny little okay. thing. And so that was fine. And he would always, you know, like buy me a gift or make a big gesture of apology. And then, you know, he would start to push buttons. Like he would always, one red flag that I know now and I tell everybody, all of his exes were crazy. He would talk about how crazy uh -huh. all of his exes were. And like, that's a red flag because uh -huh. what's the other side of that story? Common you know, denominator. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, that sort of was why he didn't have a lot of friends. And that's why, you know, this, he had explanations for everything. And he would just start to do things like he would always compliment me. And then one day, like I wouldn't be wearing makeup because I was getting ready for bed. And he'd be like, oh, do you ever wax your upper lip as an example? And I'd be like, yeah. And he's like, oh, it just, you can really see it in the shadow. Wow. And so, you know, and I was just like, oh. And then he'd be like, like, I don't mind. I just, if, you know, if you're overdue, you should get that done. Like, it was just a little way to break me down. Yeah. And it's like that comment on its own, like, kind of douchey. But, you know, oh, like, thanks. Yeah, maybe I had forgotten about it or, you know. Yeah. And he would just do these little tiny things until, you know, we moved to a more committed part of our relationship where we like adopted a cat together, you know, and then maybe wow. the next thing he would do would be a little bit more serious, but like, what are we going to do? Like break up? Who's going to get the cat? We're going to have to move out. Uh -huh. It just seemed that much more harder and it seemed easier to just get over what had happened. And then, you know, before I knew it within I think within a year we bought a house and, you know, so now we're legally on this mortgage together, yeah. you know, and that's when I found out he was looking at porn and messaging a bunch of other girls. And, yeah. you know, again, like, it, like that is a break up a bull offense. But at this point it had now been a year of me having these little, you know, being broken down just a little bit, a year of me being so celebrated by family. And so it seemed like, am I going to, you know, be the one to break this all up when everybody's so happy? Yeah. And you, he counted on that. Yeah. Oh, it was very calculated. And, um, you know, he wasn't really close to his family, but they were starting to get closer once I got in the picture. So that seemed really nice. And, you know, we just, there was just these, I couldn't even pinpoint, you know, like the worst thing that he did. It was just these constant things that would happen and we would fight, but what am I going to do? And then we got a dog 
And mm-hmm. then we got a car together. And then, you know, I, I sort of knew that I wanted out, but I didn't see an out. And, you know, the, the benefits of being so included and celebrated and, you know, outweighed ticking yeah. off my boxes. I was like, I guess it's just yeah. me, you know, I'm the problem. And, you know, the, the most physical it kind of ever got was he would start to push boundaries where, you know, he'd be tickling me and like tickling is only fun until somebody says stop and until somebody's not having fun. And so I'd be like, okay, okay, that's enough. And then I'd be like, okay, that's enough. And he would keep doing it, keep doing it. And I remember one time he was doing it and I was trying to physically get away. And I finally like picked up like a kitchen stool and like swung it in front of myself And he just stopped and he looked me dead in the eye and he was like, I can't believe you would assault me with that. We were just having fun. Wow. And so now I'm the abuser. I'm the crazy Uh one who can't just take a joke who, you know, and he just pushed me to the point where I thought I was the, like the one doing the assaulting. It's like, you know, as you're talking, all the, all the little things it's like death by paper cut. Yeah. You know, it just keeps going and going. And, and, you know, how many thousands of paper cuts can you survive? Yeah. Because, you know, the older ones start to heal, leave a little scar and then the new one. And then, you know, and, and I think we really, I grew up in a way that you didn't really talk about the inner parts of your relationship. You only no. bragged about them on Facebook and, you know, you, everything is so celebrated. I just keep going back to that. You know, yeah. it's really encouraged. Yeah. And so I didn't know how to be like, you know, hey, Michelle, like, does Anthony ever do this? Like, I didn't have a reference for what was yeah. healthy yeah. or not. And I just assumed this is what you did, you know, and I got wind. I got suspicious that he was going to propose to me. And. I had told him, I don't want you to propose to me. And he waited. So I had a job where I organized a really big outdoor event. And there was about 2,500 people there. And he proposed on stage in front of all 2,500 people. Oh, my God. And again, by design, nobody's going to say no. No. When I look off stage and my whole family's there crying with happiness and my best friend and, you know, all of my coworkers and all this stuff. So of course I say yes. Yeah. But now I've been on this like televised public proposal. And I really use the analogy that like, once you're, once the ring lands on your finger, you're put on this, this train towards the altar that is propelled by your friends, family, and society. And I never had a chance to even say, whoa, 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 I don't know, you know, people are hugging me, crying. By the end of that weekend, we had a date and a venue. And by the time, you know, it was just he knew that he had to, like, lock this down. Yeah. And so, it like, the wedding, nobody ever stopped to say, hey, Carling, like, how do you feel about this? How is this? You know, and w- would I have been honest? I don't know. But I, I I sort of laugh at myself because when somebody becomes engaged, I always find an opportunity to mention yeah. Yeah. it doesn't matter if you're halfway down the aisle. If you decide something's not right, you leave. You know, and I, I just was never afforded Hindsight, that. And I, yeah. Hindsight's yeah. a wonderful thing. Eh? <laughs> mm-hmm. But I, I, can, I can understand as a people pleaser wanting to maintain that adulation, the happiness of the family, the inclusion that you felt, because it sounds like you did not feel it as a child. Yeah. Now this this is the you know imagined life that you wanted and and the family paying attention. So what it is, you're really being seen. Yeah. You're, you know, you're now the focal point in your life, which is yeah, kind of odd when you, you know, and it. like everybody wants that, you know, you just want to feel included. Yeah. And, you know, once you're engaged, then like the gifts start coming, you know, my dad gave us $10,000 and his dad gave us $10,000. And, you know, suddenly we had all this money to blow on a wedding and, 
you know, it, it just, yeah. I just always just kept thinking, well, it'll get better. Like people deal with things all the time and, you know, over and above all of this. So now I'm sort of being conditioned to think that I'm crazy and I'm abusive and I'm, you know, so I have to fix myself. I have to improve because he's just trying to love me and be with me, but I'm making it impossible, wow. you know? And so I'm very much a lesbian. I didn't like sex with men and it always felt forced and no was never an option. And so, you know, there's inter intimate partner rape and coercion and, yeah. you know, all of this is happening. And I just keep thinking, well, this just must be what you do, you know? And it, so that really starts to break you down and you really start, your world becomes really narrow yeah. because I'm just stuck in this horrible situation, but everybody's cheering and smiling and laughing and celebrating, yeah. you know, I, who, again, who am I to sort of be like, ah, I want out, you know, that doesn't feel it didn't feel like what, what I could do or what I should do. Yeah. And so, you know, I remember about maybe a month before the wedding. And again, I can't remember what he did, but it was bad enough that I like left and I was wow. sobbing. And one of my friends from Montreal called me and she never liked him, but she knew that if she let him put a wedge between us, you know, I would choose him because he yeah. had done that with anybody who sort of seemed unsure about him. And I can't remember exactly what I told her. I didn't tell her the whole truth, but she said, I don't want you to go home. I want you to drive to the airport. There will be a ticket waiting for you. You will come to Montreal and I will handle everything. Wow. And I was like, yeah, okay. Yeah. And she said she knew in that moment that when I hung up, if I made the decision to go home first, that was it. That was it. And I did. I made the decision to go home and pack a bag. And I obviously oh. never made it out of the house that night to go to the airport. And, you know, her and her partner at the time said, you know, we that was the night that we had the discussion that we can't get her out of this, but yeah. we're just going to be there for her. And when it falls, we'll catch her. Yeah. And you know, again, that's, that's sort of one of the nicest gifts that I didn't even know yeah. was sort of like happening in the background. And so, yeah, the, the wedding came and it's, I, I don't know if the universe had anything to do with this, but the amount of things that tried to prevent our wedding from taking place, we like woke up late, we got lost going to the church. And then as I walked under the like archway at the entrance to the church with my parents, it fell on us. And so it like literally it physically, I don't know what people believe, but it like blocked the aisle way and people had to like move it so that we could get down the aisle. And I just feel like it was like the universe being like, Going, hey. this is it. Yeah. we You're yeah. not listening to anything else. We're going to like drop something. And so, yeah, we got married and like, talk about feeling celebrated, right? That, oh my you know, God, when you're, yeah, you hit the lottery. Yeah. And like the gifts and the love and people came from out of town and, you know, his family yeah. was so welcoming of me and it just felt like, yeah, it just felt perfect. And yet on the inside, it yeah. was a nightmare. But we were weighing the good of everything else with the crap from him. Yeah. And I'd been so conditioned to second guess what I was thinking or how I was seeing things that, you know, we just, I mean, to this day, people say it was one of the most fun weddings they've ever been to. So that's good. It wasn't well, like a total, good. yeah, it wasn't a total yeah. waste, but you know, we were even fighting in the car that we had going to the photo shoot in between spots. Oh my God. We were fighting and, you know, he made comments about how I looked and, you know, it just, it, yeah, like that was, that was the wedding. And then I remember thinking, okay, well, 50% of marriages end in divorce. You know, worst case, we get divorced, but I'm at least following through with what I've said I'm going to do. Yeah. And, you know, I thought, okay, I'll just keep giving it a chance and giving it a chance. And then 
we were only married for nine months and it was a terrible nine months. And, you know, there was a few times where he'd, you know, shove me and I'd, you know, lose the wind out of me. And, you know, I, I like, I was never beat black and blue, but I would argue that the, you know, emotional abuse was more brutal. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and you, you suffer with that in silence, I think so much more than, you know, if I had a black eye, maybe somebody would have noticed, but, yeah. but and again, I don't know. Heal. Bones heal, bruises fade, yeah. emotional yeah. pain does not. Yeah. And so there was also, there was also this like weird things would happen where um, he, so he used to play, uh, I think it's called Sports Select. It's like a you buy tickets and you have to bet. I think you bet on who's going to win what game okay. or what point something. And he was always winning. He was very talented at this. He would win hundreds of dollars. And, you know, he would he would say like, oh, you don't understand it. Like this, you know, I'm going to play this game. And then he would buy me something with it. And so I was like, yeah, that's great. So cool. It's like a it's kind of yeah. a skill based thing. So it was so nine months after we got married, it was Father's Day. And I don't know why I just remember it was June 19th. And he was we now had two dogs. And he was always kind of like mean to them, but not physically really mean, but just like he wasn't kind to them all the time. And um, one of our dogs had gotten really anxious and i think now it's probably from like all the turmoil yeah. that was happening and um he grabbed him by the neck and like threw him into the wall and it was in that moment like it didn't matter what had happened to me it didn't matter what it like it was that moment that i just said this marriage is over and that was the first night where um we you know, we decided to, to break up and he was crying and I was crying, but, you know, we went to bed and, you know, it was kind of weird for a few days. And then he started getting a little bit, uh, like something turned in him and he was getting a little bit manic maybe, or I, I don't even know how psychotic is the best way. Yeah. And he would call me repeatedly through the day, but I was at work. So if I didn't answer, He'd be like, I can't believe you're now just not answering my calls. And I'd be like, I'm at work. Like, I've all, this has always been the case, you know? And then he's like, what are you doing for dinner? And I was like, oh, I like, I had a training class with the dog. So I was like, oh, maybe I'll pick something up after. And he was like, okay, so we're just not even cooking together anymore. Like he would just like, he was like looking for yeah. a fight or something. And, and, but in a weird way and more little cuts. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I had that point had severed in my head that this was this was done. And so I wasn't but it was like I was suddenly just not buying into it. And I was just remaining really calm because we had to figure out, you know, what's happening with the house, what's happening with the dogs, who's yeah. going where, you know. So at this point, I just think we're going to have a semi amicable divorce. And. It, he like this one night, it was a few days after this had that I had said this. He was just getting like more and more strange and he was walking through the house on his phone laughing. And I think he was trying to be like, oh, like he's talking to somebody yeah. and it's very funny. And he wanted me to be like, who are you talking to? But like, I genuinely didn't care. And yeah. I can't remember what I said, but he, something about he brought up something about if we'd make it work. And I reiterated that, no, like yeah. we had decided the, the marriage was over. And he just looked at me and he turned around and he grabbed a giant glass photo frame that had all of our like engagement photos and he smashed it into the coffee table and glass just shattered everywhere. Oh my God. And he, am I allowed to swear on the show? Sure. Oh, cause he said, he said, get the fuck out of this house. And so my dogs are there. So instinct was just, I got the dogs and I ran upstairs into our bedroom, closed the door and was leaning against it and he chased me up the stairs and I I called a friend who I had disclosed that our marriage was ending and I'd said like this is what's happening I don't know what to do and they were like you need to get out of that house 
Um, I like I should have called 911 and or yeah. I should have called a friend that knew my address because they didn't know my address. Oh and my so God. they couldn't have even called 911. But, you know, you learn. And so I was like, OK, I'll call you when I get to my car. So I hung up and he's banging on the door. And then suddenly he just stops banging. And I'm just waiting to see what's going to happen. And he says he, it was like a switch turned. He became really, really calm. And he said, I'm so sorry. Can you just open the door? And I was like, Chad, I don't feel comfortable opening the door right now. Yeah. And he said, I've just had a really hard day and I really love you. And I'd love to give you a hug. And I was like, it, it was just like this, the, you know, the hairs on my skin just stood yeah. up because he went from breaking something and screaming to like, he was, it's like he forgot himself and he switched into this, yeah. you know, other mode. And so after a few minutes and he was crying and I said, okay, I'm going to open the door because I'm going to leave. And I said, I don't want to hug you. And he said, okay, I just need to see you. So I like opened it. So at this point I had taken a suitcase and I just like, whatever was on the bed, it was like laundry day. I moved into a suitcase. I don't even know what I grabbed and opened the door and he tried to hug me. And I just said, I really, I just don't want to hug you right now. And then he was like, I'm just so sorry. I can't believe this. You're going to hate me. And so I just knew that I needed that was probably the first time that I was like, I don't know if I'm making it out of this situation alive. Alive. Yeah. yeah. And so I just kind of went into survival mode and I said, of course, I'm not mad at you. Like, there's nothing to forgive. You did nothing wrong. Like, I'm just, you know, you know, and I said, like, I still love you. We're going to get through this. I just think we need some space. And so, like, my first priority was getting the dogs in the car because there's glass everywhere and I don't know what yeah. he's capable of. So I go to the car, put them in. He follows me out, come back in. Um, I start putting some stuff together and he he's saying like, he's just off his rocker at this point. My grandma was really sick and he's like, are you going to let me come to your grandma's funeral? I need to be there. And I was like, of course, like, of course you'll come to the funeral. Yeah. I'm just saying whatever I need to say yeah, to, to, to get, get out. And there. He, yeah. And he's like crying and all this stuff. And he had taken my ring off of my finger at one point and like thrown it across the room. And I think he, I think he said, can I have your ring? And when I went to take it off, he like ripped it out of my hands and threw it. And so I was like, yep, like that's fine. And then I started packing my computer, our computer, because I was going to school for photography and I like needed it for school. And he was like, you don't think you're taking the computer, do you? And I was uh -huh. like, well, I was like, Chad, I just like, I need it for school. I have school tomorrow. And he's like, well, you can come here and get it. And I was like, okay, but I'm like, I'm going to leave for the night. And then he started like this, like evil started like reappearing. Yeah. And he was like, if you take that computer, you're never coming back. Like this computer became the like oh. thing. I don't know. Yeah. So I like took the computer and I ran to my car and he followed after me. I closed the door. I locked the door. And he was like banging on the window. And I rolled down the window just like a tiny crack. And I said, if you don't let me move this car, I'm going to call the police. And again, something switched in his eyes. And he was like, I can't believe you'd threaten to call the police on me. Like, like I have done not like you're the one. It, it was like this weird, like rapid fire Jekyll and Hyde. Very I, calculated. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, just let me leave and I'll just go. So I drove away. And then for probably the next 24 hours, my phone was just blowing up with phone calls, text messages, all of this stuff. And, you know, at this point I hadn't told really anybody about, you know, the abuse and the yeah. manipulation and everything. And so people were just blown away that I was leaving this marriage because everything was so great. We've only been married yeah. nine months. And that was really hard because it's like, I didn't know how much to disclose. And like, yeah. I felt like the crazy one because I'm the one ruining this perfectly good made, marriage. Made you feel that way. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't tell anybody anything. And so, you know, it wasn't until like it was it was days of this constant 
harassment. He would phone my work and leave messages. He would email. And, you know, it, it, so it probably, maybe I didn't end up going back for probably five days. And in this five days, I was talking to his stepmom and her and I had become really close. And I, he had been doing something on Facebook and I was surprised. And I said, you know, like, oh, I'm surprised that he's doing this. And she was like, well, I'm not surprised considering what he went to jail for. And I was like, excuse me? Yeah. I was like, hmm, what would you say? And so we had been texting. So she called me and she said, he went to jail. Did you know that? And I said, no, I didn't know. And we'll say his dad's name was Joe. And she was like, Joe, she fucking didn't know. And I was like, what, like, what did I not know? And so what I did not know, what nobody thought to tell me, what he had neglected to tell me was that he had spent four years in a federal penitentiary for stalking and harassing women. And he had stolen a car, evaded police, um, was in an accident that caused bodily harm to somebody. So like that mixed in with stalking and harassing women. And the in-laws didn't think to mention it? No, because they thought, well, this is great. He's finally found somebody who accepts him. They asked him. They said, you've told her the truth, right? And he said, oh, yeah, she uh, knows everything. Of course. But yeah. he had told what he had told me was about abuse. And so, you know, if anything ever got brought up where if I hadn't known anything, I would have been like, that's weird. You know, it got brought up in such a way that I was like, oh, yeah, I do know about I, you know, I just. Yeah, I did know about his past, but not actually what the truth was. Yeah, wow. You know, it was like that level of manipulation. And yeah, for I, you know, his stepmom said, like, we just loved you so much, we chose to believe that he yeah, was telling the truth, okay. and you were really great. And you know, we didn't want to wreck this by you know potentially, you know, yeah. telling you. And so, you know, it. So what had happened was he his criminal record was so extensive from the age of, I think from the age of 13 to 18, it was so consistent and escalating that when he turned 18, it didn't get expunged. Normally when you turn 18, yeah. if yeah. you've been good and done your time and whatever, it gets expunged. This was so consistent and so escalating that it stayed on his permanent record. And he was stalking and harassing women that tried to break up with him. And, you know, these were those crazy ex-girlfriends of his. Mm -hmm. But what it actually was, was they were being tormented. Normal after people that leaving. were being manipulated. Yeah. 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 And so, you know, that really, like, that really started the the next, I mean, 10 years, but probably a solid two years of him finding me everywhere I moved and he would trash my car. He would, you know, he would cut, he had a car key because it was, the car was in my name, but we owned it together yeah. and he would cut every leather seat right down to the frame. He cut all the seat belts. He slashed the tires and he did this three times. And you know, every time I would call the police and every time they would say, well, you know, you don't have an eyewitness. And I'd be like, well, but who else, like who else would do this? Yeah. And he, he had more experience being a criminal yeah. than, and getting away with it than the police had policing. Yeah. You know, the police officer maybe had been a police officer for 10 years while he'd been doing this for 15 years yeah. at this point. Yeah. And so he just knew how to get away with it. He would, he hacked into my email and he started emailing all of my exes, my coworkers from my personal email as me, like really vulgar things. And, wow. you know, then I, so then I would change my, I'd get a new email. Then I would change my phone number. He would somehow get that phone number. He hacked into my Facebook and read messages about where I was staying. And oh my God, like he just knew, he knew how to do all this. And, you know, one of the things that really is so, I don't think people realize is like, there's not much the police can do. No. no. If you don't have, you know, you've got to prove it with beyond reasonable doubt yeah. that it was him. And he knew mm -hmm. how to go undetected. And 
you know, reasonable doubt to the point of, okay, somebody hacked into your email. It could have been anybody. How do you know that it was him? You know, and so they pin it down to his IP address and the police were like, well, he's got a roommate now. It could be the roommate. We don't know that it's him. And so, you know, the things that he would get away with, I ended up having to rehome my dogs because he would, to the point that he was like calling their daycare and saying he was coming to get them. And, you know, he was determined to get the dogs. And I, I don't think that that was the right thing. So, you know, I rehomed my dogs and it's like, so now this world that I have, you know, my dogs were this like support for me. They got taken away. You know, I would use social media to keep in contact with people because my cell phone number was changing so frequently. And he kept making up fake Facebook accounts and harassing me and threatening me. God. And he would go on to, you know, the company that I worked for. He went onto their Facebook page and started writing threats to me on this public page. And he, you know, I had a photography business and he would send me messages saying, or post publicly on the wall saying it was so fun watching you today. That family sure is cute. And so now this family's like, what's happening? Like, we don't want to oh use you anymore. God. You know, he was like systematically taking away everything yep. that I had. Bring your world down to you had to reach out to him because you would yeah. have no one else. Yeah. And, you know, I, I remember one time the police said, you know, the best piece of advice we can give you is get off social media and move out of town. And I was like, but my, my whole support is like, you want me to move to a town where I don't know anybody. I have nobody else and leave everything I have here. I'm sorry. I just, I really have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, you know, like that was literally the best advice they could give me. I got a restraining order against him and the police made a mistake. The courthouse made a mistake and they put the address that I was living at on the restraining order and oh said, God. and said, like, don't go there. You're not allowed to go there. And within one hour of being released from jail, because he had been pulled in for questioning, he was there and he was driving back and forth up my street really slowly, blowing kisses and waving. And I called 911 and it took 30 minutes for them to like ping the tower to see where yeah. his phone was. And by then he was halfway across the city. Yeah. Like he was 30 minutes away at this point. And so they said, wow. you know, it was the fact that it was dark out. It was at least 50 feet away. It could have been just somebody that looked like him. <sighs> And so I couldn't prove. So, and then I was like, okay, well, I have to move now because you gave him my address and I'm yeah. not safe here. And this was the fourth time I had moved. And they said, all we can do is offer you a place in a shelter. And so now, the, you know, the only advice they could give me was I could go to a shelter and I could move out of town and I could delete my social media so that I am losing my sense of community. And they wonder why victims have a problem coming forward. Yeah. yeah. You know, and it was, it was, you know, in contemplating that, it was in those moments that I was like, what am I, why am I even fighting for, like, yeah. th there's no end in sight to this. It's digital, it's physical, it's it, like, it's everywhere. And this is what these maniacs count on. Yeah. Because you get to a point where there is nothing else for you to do. But either go back or erase your life and start all over again. That's terrible. Yeah. Or erase your life and, you know, choose suicide like that. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I don't know that I would ever consider myself having have been like actively suicidal, but that felt like the only out that I was going to get where I could just yeah, like clear. not, yeah, yeah, not have to deal with it. Yeah. Because like my options were really you know, not looking minimal. Great. Yeah. And, you know, so I, I no longer was safe just going out by myself. I was no longer safe living in the houses that I was living in. I was no longer safe going to work. Um, you know, I ended up going on stress leave. So now, you know, and my work was, you know, they didn't know how to deal with it. It was long enough oh. ago. I think that they, you know, they were sort of, we don't know how to deal with this, but this person is harassing our company now and negatively impacting our company. And it was, it was just every 
facet. And, you know, then I started talking a little bit more to friends about, you know, some of the things that would happen within the marriage. And then stories started coming out where they were like, yeah, we think he was messaging us pretending to be you, like while we were still married. Or he would message and say, you know, Carling and I have this open marriage. And she said, I could be with you. But it was like, it was weird enough that nobody felt comfortable coming to me to say anything. Yeah. Yeah. And so they were like, oh, no, that's okay. And they just thought we were weirdos. And so they would back away. Of course. You know, it's just like if I if I think through like all of these things, I do think it's like some miracle that I chose to fight and stay alive because, it is. you know, there was so he was fine. He was arrested and I think he was charged with 15 crimes in total. And so, you know, that was everything from stalking and harassing um, to vandalism, theft over five thousand dollars because he stole everything of mine. Um, I would, you know, I would go on Kijiji and see he was selling like my clothes, my skates that I just got for my birthday, my, but I could like, I couldn't prove that that was mine. And I wasn't yeah. sitting in my house. And, you know, my lawyer at the time was like, you legally have the right to stay in that house. We can ask him to leave. And then you've got your stuff. And I'm like, I'm not going to stay in that house. Oh my he God, no. The acts that, you know, and so then it started coming out that all of this money that he had been winning on these sports select ticket was he was actually just stealing money from my friends and family. Oh, my God. But my friends and family thought he was so great and I was so happy and everybody was so happy. It couldn't have been him. How do you accuse somebody? You know, you you know, they said, you know, we kind of suspected, but like we didn't know. And like, how do yeah. you? You know, like, you know, Michelle is one of them and they had gotten rent from a tenant of theirs and it was cash sitting in their office and he took all twelve hundred dollars. But there was, you know, maybe three or four couples at the house. So why would you accuse my husband? Right. Or this guy. So it was just like once I left the amount of things that started unraveling. Yeah. But it was just nobody said anything. Because no. you, I, you know, you just didn't, you don't want to be that person. You don't want to say well, something. Well, not you know. only that, okay. They finally see you happy. What they thought was happy and secure and in, in a marriage and doing all the things they wanted for you. Yeah. You know, who's going to step in and ruin that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so it just, I don't like that. It was crazy. So I think he was charged with 15 crimes. And then, you know, the way the Canadian justice system works, I call it, it's a legal system. It's not a justice system, but it's not a justice system. You know, the, you know, the, the crown or the police sort of charge him with all of these crimes that they mm -hmm. think they have enough evidence to prove beyond reasonable doubt. Um, and then there's a crown prosecutor who's the one actually doing the charging. And I'm sort of, you know, it's not me charging him, but I'm the one that's sort of like the witness and the victim in it. And it's up to that crown prosecutor to look and say, I don't think we're going to get a guilty conviction on this, 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 you know, we might have a chance with this, but you know, what if we compare, you know, put it with this and offer a deal for this, because ultimately it's taxpayer money that is paying the judge and him and, you know, all of these things. And if it's not a surefire win, it's not worth their time to prosecute and so those 15 charges got brought down to i think three or four and he was found guilty of i think three of them and you know like it it was just so and be, so each charge had to be um go before a judge separately so yeah. it wasn't like an accumulation to show the obscene amount of charges yeah. this one judge is only allowed to know about you know, this one criminal harassment case, not anything wow. else. And so, you know, I guess I see it in sort of like you're innocent until proven guilty, but it didn't paint a whole picture. And, you know, I remember being asked to give a victim impact statement and you have to submit the victim impact statement to both the, like the, the accused crown. and yeah. yeah. And the crown. So even like Chad and his lawyer had got to read it before I got to read it out loud. 
And they argued it and they said, no, you can't say that. You can't say that. You can't say that. I was only allowed to say the impact of the crime being talked about. Wow. And so like I had to really piece it apart and, you know, your brain does this thing where, you know, half the people in your world are saying, you just need to move on. You need to forget it. You need to, you know, and so my brain's like, okay, yeah, I need to like not harp on all this stuff. And then all of a sudden, three years later, you're in court and a lawyer is saying like, what was the date of this? What time did this happen? Where were you? And you have to recall all of this. How was his shirt? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, I just spent three years trying to, you know, not think about it. And now I've got a, you know, and so now I'm trying to think of the impact of just this one crime, but I have to take away all this other stuff. And so it really like breaks it down and. So what I didn't know is that when he was in jail the first time, he was diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder, which is a sociopath, yeah. basically. Yeah. And um, so then he got a pre-sentencing uh, psych evaluation done for these charges. And he, again, was diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder with a high to moderate risk to reoffend. And he had also been given a moderate to high risk to reoffend after the like last time he was in jail. Yeah. And so now, so now that he's been found guilty, the judge is able to see that he did go to jail before he did have this diagnosis. He did. So yeah. you can see this pattern and you know, when it was all said and done, he, so he at this point had a girlfriend and she was pregnant and he had gotten a job as an elevator mechanic. And so it was a wow. union job and the judge one of the judges for this one charge said, you know, he's got a family to think about now. He's got to provide for a child and he's got a good union job. So they gave him a conditional sentence, which is what? Yeah. So he got 90 days in jail, but you only have to serve it on weekends. So he would, so that he could maintain his job and his support of his family. And so he would go to jail Friday after work and leave Sunday at lunch. And that would be three days towards his 90 day. Wow. Yeah. And so, you know, when all was said and done, like, sure, he had to pay me back some damages. And I guess he went to jail for a year on weekends but that ended up being 90 days. But yeah, he, you know, and, and even after all of that, he sent the so the so meanwhile I have come out of the closet living my lesbian life and yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know just like being like this is me and Ooh, that you. wasn't me yeah and I need to like start figuring out who I am and what I want and so I was dating this girl and she was from another province she had no family or friends from childhood in the city that we live in and he sent her a friend request on Facebook. And there was no, like, there was no connection. There should be no way, you know, I purposely didn't let her come to court. I purposely didn't, like, I kept it very separate. Yeah. And so I called the police and I said, is this not indirect contact according to the restraining order? Yeah. And they said, I mean, it is, but, <laughs> you know, all he has to say is, oh, sorry, I thought it was. You know, uh -huh. it was this person that I went to school with. I thought it was that person. Yeah. And then that's reasonable doubt. Yeah. You know, I, like I it's just, just. Unfortunately, I find in Canada, our criminal system is skewed very much towards the criminal. Yeah. Yeah. And. Yeah, like I, I understand that there are innocent people, you know, in the world that go to jail, Absolutely. wrongfully convicted. And I, you know, I don't wish that on anybody, but as the victim of, you know, and so even so in February 2020, just before the pandemic, I had been going to um, like all these like drop in classes like I got, I think it's called class pass. And I forgot that my Instagram stories was public. I had kept it private, but I wanted to enter a contest like weeks before. Yeah. And so you have to have it public because you have to be able yeah. to tag. So I'd made it public. I completely forgot about it. And I had spent the last two weeks tagging like, oh, I'm at this yoga studio. Oh, I'm at this gym. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm trying this spin class. And I remember just one day for some reason I clicked so you could see who had viewed your story. And he was one of them. 
So this was 10 years after. Wow. This had all happened. He now has a child. He now has a girlfriend. I mean, they're no longer together. Shocking. I, I, was, uh, <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, and how long has she been gone? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, and I tried to reach out to her. I asked my lawyer and the police. I said, am I illegally allowed? Is there any world where I could get in trouble for contacting her somehow? Mm -hmm. And they said, no, like you can, but you know, be safe. And so I anonymously contacted her and she said, I'm assuming this is Carling. Um, you know, I know you're the crazy one. He's told me everything about you. And if you message me again, I'll sue you for harassment. Like, I, I don't like, I, okay. so now I'm one of the crazy ones, you know, and he wow. continues to this yeah. day, people send me Tinder profiles and they'll be like, isn't this your ex? And I'll be like, yep, that's him. Like he's still wow out there on, on the prowl. And, <sighs> you know, I remember one of the messages he sent me from, from a fake account was, I'm never going to stop until you're dead. And, wow. you know, that, that will never leave my mind. That will, I don't, I don't doubt for a second that through my whole life, this person will show up in ways, you know, but I, I, at some point had to make the decision that I needed to live my life and, yeah. you know, I'm careful. I don't, you know, advertise my address and I, you know, am I, I do things now that I don't think people do. No, I don't think I would say normal people, but I do things now out of habit, you know, like I'll never leave a door Nothing. unlocked. Yeah. yeah. If somebody Nothing knocks at my door and I'm home alone. Yeah. 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 I will never answer it. If an unknown number calls me, I won't answer it. You know, I just like, I have these safety things in check. Yeah. I don't go out to my alley late at night to take the garbage out. I wait till the morning. I have my cell phone in my hand at all times. And, it, you know, I, a few people have been like, oh, you're so addicted to your phone. I'm like, no, but if I find myself in a position, of, <laughs> yeah, like, you know, the, you know, that that's sort of the the outcome of of yeah. of what I've been through is I'm now this very diligent person. And it's you have to be. yeah, 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 yeah. But there were many times where. You know, I really, you know, I'd be driving in traffic and I remember thinking like, what if I just hit, you know, drove off this bridge? What if I just ran this car head on? What if I just, you know, it, it seemed so easy when I was in the thick of it and I didn't see a way out. The police yeah. didn't see a way out. My therapist didn't see a way out. Like there was no, you know, I had everything stripped from me yeah. and it would have been so easy to just make a different decision well well i'm really glad that you did not thank you me too and and i know a lot of people probably feel the same way starting with your your partner on the podcast yeah yeah it, it's it's an awful lot to take in and it's very sad that as you and i sit here and talk about this this is still happening yeah to other people and i say people yeah. because it's not just women oh no it's everybody and and i i wanted to make a point of that because yes predominantly women but it's not only women yeah she can be on the other foot and and that can be just as horrific the fact that our legal system makes it so difficult for victims is why we are where we are. Yeah. Because it took so long to get any kind of victim rights. They're not really being enforced as they should. Yeah. And, and I get erring on the side of caution. And, and like you, I understand there are a lot of people that are innocent and in our doing time for whatever that is terrible and unfortunate but I don't think it I don't think this is the answer I think the, the yeah. legal system needs an overhaul and there there has to be a little bit more for victims 
Yeah. Because I mean, I even say like, I, this is probably extreme, but you know, it, I think before being issued a marriage license, you should have to get a financial and criminal background check. Actually, that's really good. That's I, a like, really good point. Why not? Because yeah. if you are marrying yeah. somebody and you do know everything, then there shouldn't be any surprises. But absolutely, you know, and you know, I think of all of these things that if it had just happened, you know, if somebody had just said, "Hey, uh, like your you know. boyfriend is messaging me, and it feels really weird," yeah, you know, maybe I would have said something. If his family had said, "Just we just want to make sure you know about his criminal past." Yeah. Maybe yeah. something would have been different. And, you know, it, my sister had a bunch of money missing from her wedding, like the card box. Wow. And we later learned it was him, like $5,000 of gift cards and cash. Oh, my and God. And if somebody had said, you know, I guess you're risking me being upset. But, like, I just really think yeah, maybe it would have sparked you know, putting pieces together or I, yeah, I can think of so many things that we just as a society just dance around and don't want to, yeah. you yeah. know, step on anybody's toes, but like, yeah. I, I think, yeah, I think it's important that, that we all, you know, as much, as much as the initial see something, say something was brought into being for the wrong reasons. I think that that's important because when you're in it, you you can't sometimes see outside yeah. of where you're at. And and when you're manipulated and when you're pushed into a tiny box where the only out is that hand that's reaching down to keep you there. Yeah. It, it can be really, really daunting. And when you have things like you said, you you want to be accepted. You you, you love the feeling of, of feeling that you were doing what everyone expected and you were pleasing yeah. everyone. That's a very common way of feeling. And, yeah. and that's why we see this so much. And I think it's really important. I don't know. I think we have to start teaching children in school to speak up for themselves or everything. Yeah. And I really like I've changed the language I use with my stepkids, with my nieces and nephews, Michelle's kids. You know, I don't say yeah. when you get married, I say, you know, if you decide to get married one day yeah. Yeah. and, you know, I talk about um, what healthy relationships look like between, yeah. you know, starting with friendships, yes. you know, Michelle's twins are six and you know, if they're talking about their new friend, I'll say, you know, what do you like about them? How do they treat you? How do they make you feel? Because I just want people to start, you know, really thinking. I want people, to, I want kids to grow up to to really evaluate what serves them and what's what they're serving other people. Also to value themselves first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because so yeah. many of us didn't. Yeah. You know, and I think, yeah, the generations before my generation, you just got married out of high school because that's what you did, because yeah. that's what your parents did, because that's what their parents did. Be, You know, and I think you had a career, you got married, you got two kids and a dog. Yeah. Yeah. You know, even yeah. thinking back to my grandma, who's 92, she worked at a bank and she loved her job so much. And when she got engaged, she had to quit because yeah. you couldn't be engaged or married or pregnant and have a job. Yeah. Like, and so it just like right away, she was, you know, just taken from what she knew and loved. So I don't know. I just think, and uh, to, you know, to my dying day, when I find out somebody's engaged, I will always have that conversation with them. I think that's important. I think it, it's really good of you to take that on yourself. Yeah. Because if someone had done it for you, we wouldn't be talking today. Yeah, like just slow down and, yeah. you know, really think about, you know, do your beliefs align? Do your goals for life align? Are you treated kindly? You know, yeah. all of these. Yeah. 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 It's, uh, it really does make one wonder when, when you see people, because sometimes, sometimes you don't want to offend. Yeah. You know, your your friend, I, I had a friend who got married and it was actually the opposite. 
uh, and I gave him um, the ideas for how to woo this person, and I feel terrible to this very day. Um, it's it's now over, and that's a wonderful thing. Right. Um, but you cannot sometimes dissuade people when they are in the thick of a manipulation. Yeah. You know, when they're, they're in those first early stages and, and you're being cocooned and, and, and gro- as you said, groomed to, to fit that mold, it can be really debilitating to have someone that you care about try to step in. Yeah. Because nine times out of 10, you will cut that person off. Yeah. And I, you know, I think we need to normalize, you know, while you're in the honeymoon phase of your new relationship, that new relationship energy, I think we need to normalize the other friends being that critical piece to keep you grounded to say like, this is so great. Like, I love this for you, but what about this? But what about, you know, and just bring it up and to not be offended when your friends are asking those questions because they just want what's best for you. Absolutely. I think that's a a really, really good point. And so today, it's wonderful to see that you're happy and whole, having a wonderful life and a really useful podcast that's helping lots and lots of people. And are you still doing your event planning? Yeah, I still... I do event planning and, um, you know, and podcasting and yeah, I just, I can honestly say that life is just so great. Excellent. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you for coming on the show today. I want to thank you for being so generous, not just with your time, but with your story. Thank you. And I want to say that. I think that luckily we we hope that someone who needs to hear this podcast will in fact hear it and maybe take a longer look at where they are in their relationships in life. Yeah. So I want to thank you so much, Carling. I appreciate you. seeing you and it was wonderful having Michelle as well. Uh, Carling and Michelle, do, I did not sign up for this. Uh, which is a wonderful podcast that you can listen to on all of uh, the podcast outlets out there. You will find all of Carling's information and links, etc., on our page on Suicide Send Forgiveness. I look forward to seeing you next time. And in the meantime, make the most of your today every day. Thanks a lot. Thank you for listening. Please subscribe on your favorite service. Suicide Zen Forgiveness was brought to you by Truel Social Media, the digital integration specialists. Let them get you on page one in the search results.